Well, for the record, if I go over on time, I just want to make it clear that it's because of Dirk. <laughs> Many minutes with missions today. Now, I think, it's, I think it's quite amazing how something as simple as a man being born in a unique way and then dying for the world has such a global impact all these years later, 2,000 years later. It's, it's pretty amazing how God has had a plan and a scheme that has lasted throughout all of human history, and here we are reaping some of the best of the benefits that God has for us. In case it's not on your radar, I want to remind everyone that Christmas is only 360 days away. So make sure you got that on your calendar. We're going to have a great time. I hope your Christmas was joyful and pleasant. It's certainly my favorite holiday of the year and maybe one of my favorite just times to be together with family and friends, and it's just very sweet and very special. Not only have we experienced the Christmas season these past few weeks at Renton Bible Church, but we've also been looking at the biblical roots of why we celebrate this holiday. So whether you've been with us or this is your first time at Renton Bible Church, welcome. And also, I would like to welcome you to our series through the book of Luke titled Good News, The Life of Christ Through Birth and Resurrection. If New Year's resolutions was a thing in Israel, this would probably be about the time that Mary and Joseph renewed their gym membership and started the keto diet, and everything is returning back to normal. Except it's not, because God is doing a new thing in the world, and everything is about to change in the course of human history, and that's why we're here today. In our main text today, in Luke chapter 2, Joseph and Mary we will see they receive even more good news, and namely, that is the clarity about the destiny of their child, Jesus. I invite you to turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 2. In Luke chapter 2, verses 21 to 40, we're going to see Mary and Joseph taking their child Jesus to the temple to present him as the law of Moses commands, And then they will be visited by two special guests. Uh, Before I give you the context of our passage, I just want to define two words that you might hear me use today a lot. The first word is Messiah. Messiah comes from a Hebrew word that means an anointed one. In other words, God's presence and power rests with the anointed one of God and I refer to Jesus as the Messiah many times today, just as the Bible does. And the Messiah, in in short, is a political and a spiritual savior for the people of Israel first, but then those benefits will eventually affect the whole world. So that, that term Messiah is what I mean by that. The second word that I will probably use a lot today is the word prophet or prophetic. And simply put, Um, A prophet is somebody who is uniquely called to speak on God's behalf about the truth of God. And that could be through quoting the word that he's already given us, and it could be a divine interpretation of the present, or even truth about the future that hasn't been seen yet. So when we speak of prophetic things in the Bible, these are unique people that God has given an anointing to, to speak for him. And we will see two people do this today for Joseph and Mary. So the context of our passage is this. God has been speaking divinely to many individuals and groups of people in about the year 1 AD. We see this in Joseph's dream when God tells him the things that are about to happen and where Joseph needs to take his family so that they're safe. We see divine communication from God when Mary is sent, when is sent a message from Gabriel to tell her that she is going to bear the Son of God and the Holy Spirit will overshadow her and that his name will be called Emmanuel. We also see divine communication in Zechariah's prophecy 
which gives us the beginning of new insight to the destiny of Jesus. And then finally, the angels come to the shepherds, and the shepherds are praising, and they say glory to the God, to God in the highest. So divine communication is happening, and God is opening the heavens, so to speak, to tell the world what he's about to do in the child Jesus. Now, God has been telling Israel through the scriptures for a long time that this Messiah would be a spiritual and political savior, but now the time has come, and the world will change forever through this child. In the Gospel of Luke, he indicates some key events with the word days, D-A-Y-S. Let me just read you a few of them to highlight some of the major events in, the child, in Jesus' childhood. Most of these are in Luke chapter 1. Uh, verse 5, in the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zacharias. And we learn about how him and Elizabeth have John, Jesus' cousin. Verse 23, it says, when the days of his priestly service were ended, he went home. And Elizabeth became pregnant, and she was alone for five months. In chapter 2, we see that key word again. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus, and a census was taken of all the land. And while they were there, the days were completed for her to give birth. And our passage begins with this key word. When eight days had passed before Jesus' circumcision, the name was given to him by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And so we see Luke using this repeated word to indicate here's a new key event in the, in the beginnings of Jesus' days. Also, in this passage, there's a transition from Bethlehem to Jerusalem. Uh, his parents are from Nazareth, but he was born in, in Bethlehem. And they come to Jerusalem because Jerusalem is an important city for religious purposes in, in God's economy. And then finally, the day that we come to in our passage today, this is the last day of about a week-long celebration called the Feast of Tabernacles. And this feast in Israel is very significant, especially related to the birth of Jesus, but today I will not go into that very much. Um, but at the bottom of your sermon outline, I left you a link by the Bible Project if you'd like to look at the significance of the Feast of Tabernacles and the Feast of Israel. So this is where we are today, and in this story, we will see how Jesus is further revealed as the world's promised Savior. So as I share what God has shared with me, I encourage you and challenge you to think of how the question, how this question is being answered. How is the truth of Jesus further revealed to Mary and Joseph? First of all, the truth of Jesus is revealed in response to obedience. If we read in our passage, starting in verse 21, it says, and when eight days were completed before his circumcision, the name was given Jesus, the name given by the angel earlier before he was conceived. And when the days for their purification, according to the law of Moses, were completed, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male that opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice according to what was said in the law of the Lord, they gave a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Jewish life revolved around the Torah, which refers to revelation from God in the first five books of the Tanakh, which we call the Old Testament now. Let me give you a common Jewish mindset of the Torah from Psalm 119. I'll list you a few verses for you. This is King David writing these words, and concerning the law or the Torah of God, he says, give me understanding so that I may observe and keep your law with all my heart. Burning indignation has seized me because of the wicked, and they forsake your law. May your compassion come to me so that I may live because your law is my delight. Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. Your law is truth. The wicked are far from your law. Those who love your law have great peace. 
and nothing causes them to stumble. And so this is what Jews thought about the law God gave them, that it's something to be kept close to the heart, it's something that the wicked shun, and it's something that keeps them from stumbling and gives them great peace. Last week, we heard Pastor Dan talk about how we get great peace from the good news that we see in the beginnings of Luke. And today, the the key word is we also gain clarity. We gain clarity about the truth of Jesus and the good news that he brings to us. And so as we read these, these first opening verses that they went to Jerusalem and Jesus had that medical procedure performed that God commanded in Leviticus 12. And Mary had stayed alone for the proper amount of days and they gave the proper sacrifice. What's going on here is we see clearly that Joseph and Mary are law-abiding citizens. If you look at verse 22, 23, 24, 27, and 29, we see the key phrase, the law of the Lord, or the law of Moses. And that's a key phrase that's repeated through this passage. And we see continually that Joseph and Mary are doing things by the book, the way that God wanted them to do it. So Joseph and Mary are law-abiding Jews. And they obeyed and honored God by respecting three major things in this story. Joseph and Mary honored God, first of all, by identifying with the covenant. They acknowledged God's covenant by having Jesus take upon himself the medical procedure of circumcision. And it was an outward sign of national identity in Israel. God said to Abraham in Genesis 12 and the following chapters, I'm going to use you and your descendants to bless the whole world. And as a way for you to remember the promise that I have with you in this agreement that I'm going to keep on my end, I want you to circumcise all of your male descendants, and it's going to be a reminder of this unique relationship I have with you. So when a Jew would, when a male Jew is circumcised, it was a way of their parents acknowledging to God that we are the continual generation of our forefather Abraham, and we honor your covenant God by this act of obedience. So it was an outward sign of national identity, and it was a way for the people of God to identify with each other as a group, but also with their God individually. Uh, You can also read in Genesis 17, 7, that God gave this specifically as a way for them to not forget what God has done for them. They also honored the ceremony that God gave, the ceremony of purification. For religious purposes, certain activities like childbirth rendered people unfit for social interaction. So they would seclude themselves or cleanse themselves with other religious activities. And so for Mary, since she had just been pregnant and delivered a baby, she was considered religiously or ceremonially unclean for a certain amount of days. And so that's why Luke says that she performed her proper amount of um, cleansing or purification. And again, this is because Joseph and Mary are law-abiding Jews. They're doing things by the book. They're honoring the covenant of God and honoring the ceremony of God. You can read more about the laws of motherhood and where this is outlined in Leviticus 12, 1 through 8, if you'd like. Just to let you know, there's no more ceremonial laws in the Bible that's required of us to keep. There's different kinds of laws. There's moral laws, which all people at all times are obligated to keep because they're a reflection of God's character. There's judicial laws, like how we have speed limits today and codes to keep buildings safe. It's about order and fairness. And there's also ceremonial laws. And this is one of the ceremonial laws. And it has a religious significance to it. And they are designed to point forward to how Jesus would fulfill those once and for all. And this is one of them. Joseph and Mary remained ceremonially pure and kept these technical details of the Torah to demonstrate their obedience to God. And then finally, they acknowledged the city the city of God, Jerusalem. Throughout the, city, throughout the Bible, there's two major cities that are always at odds. That's Babylon, the city of Satan, and Jerusalem, the city of God. And God chose Jerusalem to be a geographical center for his focus and where his people have been given a right to live throughout all the ages. And by coming to Jerusalem, 
it shows that Joseph and Mary read their Bible and they come to the right places at the right times and for the right reasons. So they came down for the holiday and they respected the special dwelling place of God. So in short, Mary and Joseph demonstrate their obedience through their reverence of God's covenant ceremonies and city. And in addition to these, they also were obedient by naming Jesus the name they were given by Gabriel. Joseph and Mary were obedient and God responded. It's not surprising to hear from God when you're walking in obedience. Can anybody testify to that? Do you usually hear from God when you're walking in obedience or when you're ignoring what God's told you? I can certainly say that the former is true. God was pleased with their faithfulness. And just as God moved in the lives of Mary and Joseph, I encourage you also to put your faith in God and watch what happens when you obey. Watch how he moves in your life. Watch how he reveals the truth to you and the peace that you get from him. This, these few verses, to start off our passage, is the evidence that God revealed the truth of Jesus in response to the obedience of Joseph and Mary. The truth of Jesus is also revealed through prophetic ministry. There's that word again, prophetic. And here, two special characters visit Joseph and Mary. And the meat of the sermon will be in Simeon's testimony and what he has to say about Jesus' destiny. But we'll also look at a woman called Anna and see what she brings to the table. How is the truth of Jesus revealed through prophetic ministry? First of all, through Simeon's reassurance of the Messiah. This devout man has been promised by the Holy Spirit that he would live to see the Messiah. Let's look at what the text says about Simeon. I'm going to read his whole section, and then we'll focus back on this subpoint. So I'm going to read 25 to 35 now. So after Mary and Joseph came down and did these things according to the law, verse 25, And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout, looking for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And he came in the Spirit. No, sorry, verse 26. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death until he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the Spirit to depart in peace according to your word. Because my eyes have seen your salvation which you have prepared in the presence of all people. He will be a light of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. And his father and mother were amazed at the things that were being said about him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, behold, this child is appointed for the fall and the rise of many in Israel and for a sign to be opposed. And a sword will pierce even your soul to the end that many hearts of people will be revealed. This is the testimony of, of Simeon, verse 25 to 35. One of the three ways we see his testimony about Jesus unfold is that he has reassurance about who this child is. He says in verse 25, he says that this child was the consolation of Israel that he was looking for. Simeon understood very well that the situation in Israel was not good, uh, politically or religiously. The consolation of Israel is a phrase taken from the book of Isaiah in chapter 40, and it's also repeated in Acts 28. And God knows that his people have been oppressed for a long time by the surrounding nations and by their own sin. And Israel needs comfort from their Lord, and that's partially why Messiah has come. There was a complex political atmosphere in Israel at the time. There was a local Levitical religious system that God implemented and had been going on since he gave it, but there's also a national Roman rule that 
hovered over the Jewish lifestyle and didn't let them have the freedom God wanted them to. This national Roman rule involved division and conflict between rulers and citizens. There was brutal taxation and economic challenges. There was a lot of poverty. And also there was religious and cultural clashes. The culture of Rome had polluted some of the religious life of the Jews. Now, some of you today might automatically assume that there's just a separation of church and state, so to speak, back then, but that's not the way it was. Rome had implemented what was called client rulers, and it means that some of the religious characters in Israel were on Rome's payroll, like Herod, for example, and they abused their office and didn't honor God as he ought to have been. So the Pharisees' religious and political influence was certainly not helpful for the Jews' spiritual well-being. Uh, we see that very clearly at the end of, go- of John's Gospel when Jesus is being brought to trial and Pilate is asking the crowd, what should I do with him? Maybe I should let him go. He's, he's been whipped. He's been, he's been hurt. I, I, think that, I think that enough punishment has come to this man. And even though Pilate's conclusion is, I find no fault with him, it says in John 19, now there was a day, it was the day of preparation before the Passover feast, and it was about the sixth hour, and he said to the Jews, behold, your king. And so they cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. And Pilate said, shall I crucify your king? And the chief priest said, we have no king but Caesar. And I think that this is perhaps the most chilling statement in the Gospel of John. That they were willing to disavow Yahweh as their king just to turn the Romans against Jesus. How wicked. How disappointing. The wicked shun your law, said David in Psalm 119. They didn't care about the Torah. They cared about their status and they denied God's own kingship just to sway Pilate to go against Jesus. The temple and the state authority, as I said, were mixed with corruption through these client rulers, and they were illegitimate in the eyes of the people. The priesthood took advantages of peasants and widows, and under Roman rule, Israel's culture was collapsing. Jewish resistance to political powers also existed, And there was some messianic movements and anticipation because in Genesis 49, God prophesied through Jacob to his 12 sons. And he says that authority from Judah will not depart until the one to whom it belongs comes. And so they see that that the authority to govern themselves is being taken by Rome. And so people are saying, well, Messiah is probably here because we're seeing our our self-governance being taken from us. So all all of this prophetic convergence is coming together and and some of Israel, the ones who read their scriptures, are anticipating Messiah correctly. What was Jesus' agenda with politics? Well, he encouraged the community to be renewed inwardly because Jesus knew that renewal from the inside is truly what changes a nation. And he cared about people's view of politics, but how he spoke of it was very interesting. Uh, Jesus certainly did call out and oppose corrupt authority. He called out the wickedness of evil rulers in Luke 13 and other passages. But Jesus' ultimate solution for corrupt politics was not acceptance or rebellion. It was somewhere in the middle. It was a mix of honor and disagreement, as Romans 13 puts it. So all this being said, the phrase, may I see the consolation of Israel, was a Jewish form of blessing and hope in God's promise of comfort through Messiah. Israel needs comfort, and comfort himself is here. Simeon is being used by God in this passage. Verse 25, it says the Holy Spirit was upon him. Verse 26, this revelation was revealed to him by the Holy Spirit. 
And verse 27 says that he was in the spirit when he came into the temple. So the spirit of God is certainly influencing and using him to speak and using him to go to the right places. And he's under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to speak and to, to act accordingly. And God wants to use you too. When we see supernatural activity in the Bible, it's not just for the Bible times, because the Bible speaks of these times and times to come. And God still uses people supernaturally. And James says that we'd, if we draw near to him, he'll draw near to us. And whatever we ask in his name, it will be given to us. And Jesus said, the Father is more than willing and pleased to give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him for him. So if you are encouraged, inspired, when you read biblical passages about people being used by the Spirit of God, all you got to do is ask and seek God, and he will fill you, and he will use you. Simeon is being used by the Holy Spirit, and he wants to use you too. Acts 1.8, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and you will be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. A quick note on verse 26, it says that after he is here to look for the consolation of Israel, it said it was revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death until he had seen the Lord's Christ. Has God ever revealed anything to you about your life now or, or something later? I'm not going to share the details, but God actually did reveal to me at some point in my life that I wouldn't die until I see something specific. I won't tell you what that is. You, you feel free to come ask me later if you want, but it's kind of cool. Does that mean I'm immortal? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. But there in this verse where it says that he, the Holy Spirit was upon him, it says that it was revealed that he wouldn't die until he saw the Messiah. But the phrasing is interesting. He says that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And right here in verse 26, we have the Trinity present. The Holy Spirit revealed that he wouldn't die until the Lord's Christ was seen by his own eyes. And all throughout the Bible, we have hints and sometimes very explicit mentions of the three persons of what we call the Trinity or the Godhead in the Bible. And God has always been a personal being because he's always had multiple persons within what he is. So God never learned to love. He has always loved within his own nature. And he's here to share that with us through the Trinity's love. So this is Simeon's reassurance of the Messiah. The comfort of Israel is here, and his own personal promise that God gave him is, has been given to him. Second of all, we see in verses 27 to 32 the recognition of Simeon's testimony. And in this part of the passage, the Holy Spirit tells him that Mary's baby is the Messiah, explicitly. Verse 27, and he came in the spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought him in, the child Jesus, to carry out for him the custom of the law, he took Jesus in his arms and blessed God and said, now, Lord, you can let your servant depart in peace according to your promise, because my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples. He will be a light and of revelation to the Gentiles, and the glory of your people, Israel. The concept of blessing is not new in the Gospel of Luke. It pervades the entire book up to this point. In chapter 1, we see Elizabeth blesses Mary. And we see that Mary blesses God. And then we see that Zacharias blesses God. And most of the uses of the word blessing in the book of Luke, about half of them, is right here in the first couple chapters. And this is just more indication that this is God's gift to the world. And God is blessing his people through Jesus. The best Christmas gift anybody could ask for or receive. And from the bottom of his heart, Simeon can't help but bless God. It's the will of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 12 and 14 talk about spiritual gifts in the church and how the Holy Spirit uses people to comfort and, and uh, exhort and console. 
And it says in verse 3 that nobody can say while they're being inspired by the Spirit that Jesus is accursed. And no one can confirm his lordship without the Holy Spirit. You might be able to say certain words with your mouth, but you can't speak from your heart blessing about God without the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's will is to use you to bless God and to share the truth of God with other people. This is what he does. He glorifies the name of Jesus through us, and he's doing that with Simeon. When the Spirit of God uses you, your words honor God. Simeon viewed his own death as a peaceful departure in verse 29. He says, Now, Lord, you may let your bondservant depart in peace according to your word. What gives you peace? Is it your 401k? Is it having a reliable car? What lets you let out the sigh at the end of the day? It's different for all of us. The point that I want to emphasize here from, from Simeon's own testimony is that when you behold God's salvation, you are ready to leave this world too. And when that peace is in your heart, every other obstacle in life is almost meaningless because at the end of it all, we know that we will be with God forever. And Simeon refers to Jesus, the baby, as God's salvation. And Simeon is just so full with contentment and happiness. And he says, okay, I can die now because I've seen the Messiah. You fulfilled your promise and I've beheld your salvation. And I hope that if you haven't already, that at some point in your life, hopefully sooner than later, that you also behold God's salvation and that you give Jesus the, the opportunity to enamor you with his beauty and with his words and what he's done in the, in the gospel of Luke and others. So if you haven't given Jesus the time of day and to give him the opportunity to show you who he is, I encourage you to stick around and to journey through Luke with us as Dan continues to share. Jesus is the salvation of God. That means that the peace of God is not universal. It's conditional. Let me put it this way. The peace of God through Jesus is universally offered and it's conditionally received. And we, we see this condition back in verse 14 of this chapter, which Dan shared last week. The angels are declaring glory to God in the highest and peace on earth among men with whom he is pleased. Or depending on your translation, it might say with whom his favor rests on. So the peace is, is for everyone. But if we receive Jesus by faith, then we are pleasing to God and we actually receive the peace with God. And then we can have true peace with other people. And this is that conditional peace that he wants us to receive. Jesus said in uh, John 16, he says, I give you peace, but not the kind of peace the world gives you. I leave it with you so that even when you know, things go bad, you will know that I've overcome the world. And you can be overcomers too by your faith. Uh, Jesus said also that um, the Holy Spirit will bring us peace. And the fruit of the Spirit is peace. And if we set our minds on the things that are worthy of praise in Philippians 2, then the peace of Christ will guard our hearts in Christ Jesus. So God does have peace for you. But we have to receive it from him directly. It's not out in the world somewhere. It's from God. If you don't have peace... I want to share a verse with you that has helped me in my earlier years of following Jesus, uh, especially related to my own walk and my own standing with God. Love through obedience res can restore lost peace, especially related to our assurance of salvation. We know that Jesus is our salvation, and when we receive him, we know that he is faithful. But sometimes we forget how powerful his hold is on us. In 1 John 3, 18 to 22, he says, little children, referring to the church, let us not love with just what we say, but also with what we do. 
we will know by this that we are of the truth and we will assure our hearts before him, even if our hearts condemn us, because God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Beloved, if our heart condemns us, if it does not condemn us, then we have confidence before God. And whatever we ask for him, we keep his commandments and we do the things that are pleasing in his sight. So if you're struggling with assurance and you feel like, man, I'm pretty sure I got that peace from God, but I'm not feeling it right now. I encourage you to try more radical obedience, not because it gets you more saved, but because it helps your heart be convinced of your standing with Jesus. Uh, Somebody I used to intern for uh, many years ago named David Lawler is a pastor now of a church in Cedar Woolley. And he said, believers may experience low levels of assurance when they have low levels of obedience. And the opposite is also true. Believers may experience low levels of assurance when they have low levels of obedience. Jesus wants us to not just receive his peace, but he wants us to feel it so that it influences how we live. And we do it through obedience, just like Jesus' parents. Jesus is called your salvation, verse 30. And I think that's probably the key title that he has in this whole passage. And again, the main idea today is that the, the truth of Jesus is further revealed through obedience of his parents and prophetic ministries from Simeon and Anna. Your salvation, it is inspired by Isaiah 62, 11, where he says, Behold, the Lord has proclaimed to the ends of the earth, say to the people of Zion, your salvation comes, and behold, his reward is with him and his recompense is before him. And as Dan quoted earlier, Jesus quotes that, and, but he's actually saying it in real time. He says, Behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to render to every person according to what he has done. Jesus is the salvation promised by God, and he keeps his promises. And we see that very clearly in Jesus. God's salvation is not an economic liberation. It's not an environmental improvement and it's not a political solution. The salvation of God is a personal relationship, and he will be our peace, says the prophet Micah. This good news is for everyone. It's not just for Israel. It's first to Israel, but it's not just for Israel. We continue in the passage. He says that in verse 32 at the end of his blessing to God. He says, "You, I've seen your salvation with my own eyes, And he will be a light of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people, Israel. So don't just read this passage and think, well, this is something God did for Israel. It's also something God did for you. And I hope that you receive it if you haven't already today. Moving on to the last part of Simeon's testimony, we have Simeon's revelation And here we see people's acceptance of Jesus, the rejection of Jesus, and Mary's agony. And now Simeon is switching gears with who he's talking about specifically. First, Simeon blesses God. He's holding Jesus and he's enamored with the fact that he's holding the Messiah. And now he's turning to Mary and Joseph and he's going to bless them now as we see the truth of Jesus continue to be revealed. I'm going to read verse 33 to 35. His father and mother were amazed at the things that Simeon had said about Jesus. Isn't that amazing when other people talk about your kids, that they're just little angels? And then you get home and the costume comes off. And Simeon blessed them and he said to Mary, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rise of many in Israel, and he will be a sign that is opposed, and a sword will pierce your very soul. And to the end, many thoughts from people will be revealed. Jesus ultimately determines a person's success or failure. He says that this child is appointed for the fall and the rise of many in Israel. Now he is talking about something more specific, but for our purposes, ultimately how successful you are in life has 
not too much to do with what you inherited or what kind of income you have or the talents you were born with or the lack of. It's about whether we accept Jesus as who he is. And if we reject the Christ, then we will fall on him and we will break into pieces. You certainly don't want to be broken in pieces because of rejecting Jesus. In Jesus, we have the comfort and the peace that God wants us to have. And he wants us to rise to the occasion and at the end of the age, rise into a newness of life through a glorified body. Those who put their trust in Jesus, physical death is not the end for us. There's a promise of eternal life with God. And that is the ultimate rising that people experience who put their trust in Jesus. So if you are wondering, how am I doing in life? Ask yourself, how am I doing with Jesus? Because he is life. And what, how you determine and deal with Jesus will determine the outcome. It says in John 1, 11, that Jesus came to his own and those who were his own did not receive him. Jesus in Matthew 7 said, enter through the narrow gate because the wide gate is the one that leads to destruction. And many people find that one. But the gate that's small and narrow is the one that leads to life. And there's few that find that one. It can be difficult to find the narrow gate because it's hard to see. But that's also why God gave us, not iPads, but the Bible. <laughs> it might look like a big book. That's okay, though. It's not meant to be understood in a year. We can read it in a year, and that's very helpful. But it's meant to be a lifelong journey. And God teaches us also through how he works in our life while we're reading the scriptures. This is the testimony of Simeon. He switches from Messiah, and then he talks specifically about Mary, and he says, a sword's going to pierce your soul concerning your son. And he speaks of the ongoing agony and pain that she will experience as she sees her son be rejected by so many around him. And the ultimate culmination of that pain will be when he's on the cross. And Mary is standing at the feet, and John commits her to, to John so that she has someone to take care of her after he's gone. And he's saying, Mary, you're going to have a lot of pain because of what Jesus is going to go through, but it's going to be worth it because the whole world is going to be blessed through your son, through this death. Joseph and Mary already knew that their son was special, but I think this passage that we're in today is the first time that they start to realize the scope of Jesus's ministry, that it is a global thing, and not just in the land of Israel. And then finally, he says, on account of him, thoughts from many will be revealed. And what he's basically saying is, how you, treat, how you live your life reveals what you think about Jesus. And it's actually pretty obvious. If you just watch somebody for a while, you start to see whether they know and, and maybe also love Jesus. So I encourage you to trust God, to be obedient, and pay attention to the signs in your life. Because he loves you and he wants you to know them. In these verses we just looked at, essentially Simeon is telling Joseph and Mary, this is your son's destiny. He will bring salvation, he will bring peace, and he will bring light and revelation to all. Next is the testimony of Anna, and this is a shorter part of, of the message today. Um, and funny enough, Anna doesn't say a word in this whole uh, passage. Simeon has lots to say, but Anna, her words are concealed. So real quick, in your sermon outline, I, I edited it a couple nights ago. So there's now three words that start with D. The first one is descent. Anna's descent, we see in starting in verse 36, says this. There was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. And she was advanced in years, having lived with her husband for seven after her marriage. And then she was a widow to the age of 84. And she never left the temple. She served day and night with fasting and prayers. And at that very moment, she came up and began giving thanks to God and continued to speak about Jesus to all who had been looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. So again, verse 36 is her descent. 
She comes from the tribe of Asher. And depending on who you were in Israel, certain tribes had an easier time counting their lineage as others, and she managed to, to track hers, or at least Luke did for us. And even though she doesn't say anything in this passage, or at least that we don't have recorded, she's called a prophetess. Hence why this second heading in the sermon is that Jesus is revealed through prophetic ministry. Simeon obviously prophesies about things to come. Anna is called a prophetess here in verse 36. But also, interestingly, her father, Phanuel, his name means the vision of God. Anna is, is the daughter of the vision of God. It's just neat how people's names correspond to what's happening in the Bible a lot of times. So there we see her descent. She's Phanuel's daughter from the tribe of Asher. Verse 37 uh, so that we see that she is a dedicated woman of God. And even though, even though she had lost her husband, she obviously is a faithful woman. I mean, she was a virgin from birth all the way to age 77, and then she was married for seven years, and her husband passes away, and she's still happy as can be, and she's serving God, and she's not letting her loss determine her eternal emotions for the rest of her life. And I think it's neat when people put Jesus first and then, you know, the blessings come and they go, but we're still about the Lord's work. And we see that very clearly in Anna's life. She's clearly a, a nice old lady who loves the Lord. And um, it's, it's amazing. She's fasting and praying and in the temple. She's a, she's a real churchgoer, so to speak. She's devoted, and so is Simeon. These people are devout, righteous, devoted, and committed to the Lord's work. That's her devotion. And then finally, her declaration, which we don't actually see. It says in verse 38 that she began giving thanks to God and continued to speak about Jesus to all who had been looking for him, who is the redemption of Jerusalem. Her words are not revealed to us readers, but again, she clearly loved the Lord and was evangelistic in her demeanor. She's outgoing. She's about the Lord's work. Her descent, her devotion, and her declaration are given here. I want to compare and contrast Simeon and Anna to conclude today. They're both only mentioned in Luke chapter 2. So we're not going to find information about Simeon or Anna anywhere else in the Bible. Simeon's name means he who obeys or hears, and Anna means gracious. Simeon and Anna, when we compare them, or sorry, when we contrast them, we see that God uses people differently. Simeon's a man. Anna's a woman. Simeon was on the move, verse 25. Anna never left the temple, verse 37. His words are revealed to us, and her words are concealed. Or in other words, Simeon shines through his words and Anna shines through her activity. Simeon held Jesus and Anna merely beheld Jesus. Simeon is mentioned alone and Anna is associated with other people. And the reason I want to point this out is that God uses people differently. You might be married. You might be single. You might be a woman. You might be a man. You might be young. You might be old. You might have a more lonely life. You might have a big network of people that you do ministry with. And the point is that God uses everybody uniquely. But ultimately, he still uses you all towards the main goal. And we see that when we compare Simeon and Anna. Here's how they're similar. They're both dedicated and righteous, and they both bless the Lord. They both serve God through prophetic ministry, and they both bless God and others. Godly people are a blessing to others. And so far in the good news that we see in the Gospel of Luke, Joseph, Mary, Simeon, Anna, and Jesus has blessed other people up to this point. And we're going to see a lot more. Here's a couple verses from the Psalms about this. Psalm 145, 10 all your works give you thanks, and your godly ones will bless you. It is you who blesses the righteous person, and you surround him with favor as a shield. 
peace on earth among those whom he is pleased, his favor. And then finally, a righteous man who walks in integrity, how blessed are his descendants after him. This is how God wants us to live. He wants us to live dedicated to him, obedient to him, and he wants us to be used by him and bless other people. And then to, to finish the last two verses, it says, when Joseph and Mary performed everything according to the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee to their own city in Nazareth, and the child continued to grow and become strong. And the favor of God, the grace of God was upon Jesus as he grew in wisdom. Jesus grew outwardly and inwardly. I think that's interesting because he is truly God and he's also truly man. And through Luke, we will see the, the human nature of Jesus emphasized. If Jesus had room to grow, how much more do we? Right? In this story from Luke chapter 2, we saw that the truth of Jesus was clearly further revealed to his parents giving a fuller picture of his destiny for the world. So what's your New Year's resolution? From this passage, my encouragement to you is that as we begin the new year, let us be obedient to the Lord. Let us invite him to speak in our lives and let us grow in his grace so that the truth of Jesus will be further revealed in our hearts. Will you join me in prayer? Lord, I thank you for your revelation through Luke. I thank you that we have this inspiration of just the full dedication of all these key characters. Joseph and Mary, they loved your Torah, and they did things by the book the way that you wanted them to, and you responded by giving them more clarity about Jesus. I thank you for the devotion of Anna, I thank you for the righteousness of Simeon. We thank you that Jesus is the best gift that you could give to the world. And every time we think about Christmas and celebrate it and the ramifications of Christmas, I, I pray that we would be delighted and blessed to know that it was your idea that the salvation of God is not a human creation, and we will not find it in the world anywhere except maybe in the church because that's where Jesus is. We know Jesus. You walk among the lampstands of the church. I pray that we would hear what the Spirit of God is saying to us today. I pray that your word would stick to our hearts so closely and it becomes a part of us and that we apply it diligently. We pray that you be with us and that we would be used by the Holy Spirit to be your witnesses to the ends of the earth. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I invite you to stand for today's benediction before we release you. Our benediction today comes from Romans chapter 15, where he says, Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace, in believing so that you will be abounding in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Have a great day.